is by Pete Schumer, who's uh, in Middlebury, uh, Vermont, and uh, he's going to talk about the Go course that he's been teaching how many years? Thirty years. So he, he he probably knows his subject. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Pete Schumer. Uh, I'm a math professor at uh, uh, Middlebury College, which is in Vermont. And uh, when I'm not teaching calculus and number theory and history of math, I've developed a, a Go course. Uh, it's not part of the math department. It's an interdisciplinary course. Uh, and just to give you a basic idea, uh, it's intended for first-year students. Uh, they register for the course during the summer before they start college. They have a choice of a bunch of different uh, thematic courses. Uh, and uh, once they've registered, uh, it's limited to 15 students usually, though I ask for 16 for obvious reasons. It's better to do pairings. Uh, <laughs> and it's a writing-intensive course. Uh, we meet uh, actually six hours a week. Uh, and I'm their academic advisor, so I help them choose their other courses uh, once, uh, once we get to know each other. Um, so, okay, so here's when they um, show up for the first day. Let's see if I'll push this aside a little bit. Um, they're given a, uh, what's called a course pack that I've created. It looks like this. So it's a bunch of things that I've collected and many articles that I've written about Go, uh, biographies of famous players, et cetera. Uh, so they get this course pack, and in it, uh, this is just, I can't talk about all aspects of the course in 45 minutes, but I can give you some ideas. Um, the, the course pack starts with the syllabus. So uh, the, I always start with an introductory Go book. Um, uh, it could be uh, Janice Kim's Learn to Go series, Learn to Play Go series, or possibly Iwamoto's uh, Go for Beginners. I often use the Go, A Complete Introduction to the Game by Cho Chi Kun. Um, it introduces the game very succinctly and also has some pretty interesting uh, short articles on uh, culture of Go. Um, I uh, enjoy other books. Go More Than a Game by Peter Shotwell uh, is an excellent book. And by the way, as I'm starting, I just want to thank uh, Peter Shotwell especially for organizing this conference and uh, Bob Bacon and Terry Benson for all their technical help today. Uh, and I'm honored to be here among such a distinguished group of speakers and scholars. So thank you for coming. Um, uh, I also have them read a couple of uh, books about Go. Uh, the Master of Go is a real classic by Kawabata. And occasionally we read some other books by him as well. Um, First Q is sort of a semi-autobiographical story of uh, Go in Korea. And I sometimes use Shan Sa's uh, The Girl Who Played Go, which is about uh, China during World War II and involves a, a Go player and a Japanese soldier. Um, uh, the students have to get a portable magnetic Go set, which so they can play uh, in the dorms or cafeteria, et cetera. Uh, but for the course itself, I provide uh, Go sets and a display board uh, for class. Um, and then this course pack contains all sorts of articles. So there's an article that I had written for a mathematics magazine called Math Horizons. But there's other articles, some of them you may know and others maybe not. Uh, so that's some of them listed here. Let's see. Um, here's the rest of the list for the syllabus. Um, and uh, has some you know, Nakayama articles, which are really spectacular. Uh, and I also include several famous games, and we go through them to the best of our understanding. But uh, there are basically uh, three aspects to the course. Um, so here's my welcome uh, for them. But again, uh, the class meets twice for an hour and a half, and then once for about three hours. The shorter meetings we discuss uh, the game itself, we discuss writing projects, and in the longer, sessions, we tend to play games, uh, either uh, just playing together, sometimes pair go, you know, groups of four, sometimes ren go, team go. Uh, I sometimes have them play a game to an end game and then switch sides uh, just to get their minds around playing from another person's point of view. Uh, we play some zen go, which involves, as you may know, three people, uh, and that way you're never really black or white. You keep alternating um, which side that you take and it forces you to, 
to, <laughs> thank you, to uh, think outside the box, as it were. Uh, the three goals that I have in mind for this course, by the way, one is I want to introduce the world's most interesting game, Go, to my students. I want them to learn the rudiments of the game. Uh, I want them to develop as Go players. And I want them to gain an appreciation uh, that Go is both a mathematical, analytical game, as well as a game that involves great intuition and artistry. Uh, and, and that's why we study games of stronger players, like myself, and then uh, you know, actual professional famous games. Um, a second uh, purpose of my course uh, is to treat Go as a window into East Asian culture. So through the lens of Go, I have students actually learn about other aspects of uh, religion, philosophy, um, art, architecture, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, to learn some traditions, um, especially Japanese, just because that's where I have more expertise myself. But I try to include Chinese and Korean um, traditions as well. Um, and then thirdly, um, this course is a writing course. So at Middlebury College, students have to take two writing intensive courses. So students are required to write several papers, uh, which I'll talk about next. Um, and uh, I have them write and rewrite and also uh, develop their communication skills. They give some oral presentations as well. So, okay. Um, so here's, unfortunately all classes involve grading, but that does serve as incentive to, to work a little harder sometimes. So there's class attendance and participation. Uh, there's the first paper they write is the rules of go. Uh, it's just, I tell them it should be very succinct uh, and it should be as if you just received a game box, like a new game on a, a cardboard box on the inside cover, they always have the rules. So your rules of Go should be able to fit on the, a game box cover. Uh, so it's not a long creative writing project, it's really learning how to write technically and succinctly. Uh, then they also do Go as a metaphor essay. Um, I tell them, of course, about uh, the rotten ax uh, metaphor for Go. Uh, the idea of shoot, uh, shoot on or hand talk. Uh, Go is often called uh, crows and herons, the black and white stones. Uh, and I introduce Go as a metaphor. Um, the story that I tell them, just to very briefly, is uh, an old uh, legend of one of Aesop's fables, uh, which is about 2,600 years old, nearly as old as the game of Go itself. And uh, one of the fables involves uh, two birds that are flying. Uh, and they're both dying of thirst and they're, dry, they're flying over dry land when they spot two narrow vessels, uh, flasks half filled with water. So the two birds swoop down and unfortunately their beaks are not long enough to actually reach the water that's inside of the vessels. Uh, one bird flies off frustrated but unfortunately doesn't survive. The other bird notices that there's a small pile of pebbles not far away and the bird flies over and picks up one pebble at a time and drops the stone into the water and then goes back and keeps going back and forth until the water level rises and then the bird is able to drink the water and continue its journey safely. Um, I mention this uh, fable because it's not directly related to Go actually. It, of course it has many applications to life and all sorts of situations. But it's a good metaphor for Go. Uh, first of all, the idea of placing one stone at a time, much as in a Go game, and gradually getting some effect out of it. Uh, it also requires cleverness, flexibility, and especially perseverance uh, and patience, and which is extremely important when students are starting to learn Go. So I tell them not only is it important in the game of Go, but it will be important in the course uh, as you uh, develop and learn. So. Um, their particular papers, by the way, deal with all sorts of things for Go as a metaphor. Uh, should I, where I should be standing here is what Terry's telling me. Um, okay, I just didn't want this to double, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, so what they do uh, for uh, their papers, some involve uh, talking about learning how to play soccer or piano and relate that to learning about Go, some of the same aspects. And I have them try to, you know, use concepts from Go like co, seki, uh, connections, things of that sort. Um, some people write about uh, political parties uh, or about the world at war or um, 
Uh, I've had some other very effective papers that students have written um, about uh, planting seeds and how some seeds die and others actually flourish and flower, much like uh, the ghost stones on the board, you know, things of that sort. So I've had some very nice papers from that. Um, another uh, is the Asian Art Report. So there, that's, so uh, the Go as a Metaphor is creative uh, essay. Asian Art Report is more of a research paper. I have to go to the library and learn about uh, whatever they choose. I have them choose different topics and report on them. So for example, they might talk about Chado, the way of tea, uh, or maybe Kendo, or some other martial art, uh, or maybe the No Theater, or Kabuki. Uh, and people have done all sorts of things. Um, Zen gardens, um, you know, uh, so things of that sort. And I enjoy that especially because it the students teach me a great deal, <laughs> so they do the research for me, and I learn from them and enjoy reading their papers. Um, then they also keep a learning journal. I find that people learn, uh, have different modes of learning, uh, and I find it quite useful no matter what new school you're learning. If you keep a little journal, it's not a diary, uh, so I have to remind them, this is not a diary tell me who you're going out with and what happened Friday night. This is a, a learning journal <laughs> where you make a, a couple of thoughts about the game, something you've learned, you can draw some diagrams. Uh, in the past, I've had some other papers as well. Uh, one paper is called Competition versus Collaboration. Uh, another one was uh, What I've Learned from Go. Um, which are personal things. But I've told them now to incorporate that into the learning journal. Then they also do uh, game commentaries. So just like uh, in Go World, you know, there's written out commentaries. I have them record some of their games and write out, uh, pick three or four positions and write a little bit about what would have been a better move, both from your point of view and your opponents, et cetera. And then we put these up on a uh, display board in the classroom and discuss that in a friendly manner and try to get all students involved and feeling comfortable sharing their games. Um, then there's a test. <laughs> so I haven't included that here, but I give a comprehensive exam that involves questions about Go history, uh, positions, simple positions of Tsume Go, you know, life and death problems, Tsuji problems, things of that sort. And it's a take home test. They have two and a half hours. It has to be a completely closed book, but they can use a Go board. So they can set the positions up and, and play through them. Um, and then I used to not include Go playing skill at all, but um, depending on how you want to teach the course, it could count 100%. Uh, in some sense, we're all ranked by you know, how good we get at Go. But I try to play that down. I want them to enjoy the game. Of course, some students will get much better at Go play than others, but um, I want them to feel comfortable. But yet, I count it somewhat so that they're motivated to work at their Go improvement. Welcome. Um, now, the, the, I, I work out the course completely from day by day. So this is maybe not so easy to read, but just to show you one page. So before the class even starts, I've worked out every day exactly what we're going to talk about, what's going to be covered, what the homework will be, et cetera. So just to show you one page of that. So, you know, like we're discussing Mii and Aji one day, and we're talking about our, our Go Metaphor essay. Um, and uh, we might talk about some life and death problems. Um, I talk about the blood vomiting game and the ear reddening game and things of that sort. So um, they like the stories involved with Go. Go has such a rich history, as all of you know. Uh, so it's nice to include all of that. Um, I also, even though they're not required to have any of these books, I mentioned some books that I just list here briefly. Uh, in the library, I have many books on life and death problems, Joseki, uh, Fuseki, et cetera, but also some general books that, um, that deal with the culture and history of the game that I think are very worthwhile and are a great resource for me as well as for the students. Um, OK, so how do I actually start teaching the game itself? Um, this is the order in which I, I do it. Let's see. Whoops. There. Um, so. I should mention one thing about teaching, by the way. I always feel there's sort of three aspects to being an effective teacher. One is know your subject. Obviously, if you don't know what you're going to be teaching, you're not going to be of much use. <laughs> um, the second is know your audience. I've taught Go to um, elementary school students, uh, to uh, at an adult senior learning center, and also many times, uh, probably 12 or 15 times, to college students. So I have to gear things a little differently. 
Um, and then thirdly, know yourself uh, to be a good teacher. In other words, in what modes are you the most comfortable and you're most likely to be the most successful that way? Um, so I realize for teaching, though, there's many different ways, and I'm not trying to be prescriptive. This is what works well for me, but I realize there's many other ways to approach, approach this depending on how you as a teacher uh, and your group of students feel comfortable. But for me, what works very well is to start with first capture or one capture or capture one, as I call it. Uh, and the nice thing about that, I do this quickly. Uh, so we spend 10 or 15 minutes or so uh, working on this. But uh, the idea of capture one, of course, is the first person to capture a stone wins the game. And the students can figure this out on their own. It just involves counting liberties, which is, of course, extremely important throughout their development as Go players. It involves understanding what stone capture means. Uh, it involves rapid play and immediate feedback, and then you're on to the next game. And I think those are all terrific things for the first day that you're learning Go. Um, I quickly move on to capture three. I don't want them to focus thinking that capturing one stone is, is the entire point of playing Go. So capture three has all the same attributes, but in addition, the idea of sacrificing, perhaps losing a stone or two and coming back and then capturing uh, three. Capture three, by the way, you don't have to capture three at once. Whoever captures a total of three first wins. Um, and this involves a little more patience, a little more planning. Uh, the idea of co could come up, though, not too often. Uh, but things like a snapback uh, could be a nasty surprise that could come up in this game, which was not necessary to understand in, in capture one. And then I move up to nine by nine go. So I try to move along pretty quickly so that I don't get focused on some particular aspect which doesn't exist and go at a, a higher level. Yes? What kind of board do you use for capture one? Nine by nine. Oh. Yeah, good question. Um, and by the way, Usually one or two students realize right away that they can just build a line of stones. Uh, they won't necessarily win the game, but their opponent can't capture anything, uh, which is kind of clever. But of course, it kind of changes the, the nature of the game. So I don't mention it here, but I sometimes add one more thing. After doing capture one and capture three, sometimes an intermediate thing is I call it eight liberty, eight liberty limit go. <laughs> so you can't make a group of stones that have more than eight liberties. Uh, so that uh, disallows uh, making just a line of stones and makes capture three and capture one a little more interesting, actually. But in any event, I move up to nine by nine go. And that, of course, is real go, uh, but it's much more tactical than strategic. And I usually introduce that after they've played for a day or two by playing my whole class simultaneously. So uh, I, I also teach an, a winter term course for upper level students. So I, Sometimes I have 24 students in that class. So I play each person, <laughs> and I give each person a four-stone handicap at this point. Um, I find if I give them a five-stone handicap, they, a lot can beat me. <laughs> Four is pretty good. Uh, of course, I tell them if they play perfectly, I shouldn't be able to live anywhere on the board. But um, with a four-stone game, I, at this point when they're just learning, I can win maybe half the games or so. And I think that's good. I'm not trying to prove to them how smart I am. I'm trying to show them how smart they are and how much they've learned. And the fact that they have a, a good shot at winning the game and getting some positive feedback uh, is very gratifying. Um, then within a week or so, we move up to 13 by 13 go, which involves a little more strategy, a little more global planning, of course. And it's quite a leap, as you know, when you first learn the game itself. And then 19 by 19 is completely bewildering for the, the next 100 years or so <laughs> of our Go study. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, of course, involves all sorts of things. So, um, by the way, I try to break up class as much as possible. Rather than watching me lecture like I'm doing right now, uh, I have as much gameplay as possible. I mix things up with pair go, things of that sort. I also have uh, students present. I also invite uh, people from other departments, from the religion department, philosophy, Japanese studies programs, to give short talks on uh, things that relate to uh, some aspects of Go, perhaps. Uh, and I've had visitors. Um, I've had Skip Ashheim, who uh, the late Skip Ashheim from Massachusetts Go Association. He was a very strong player. Janice Kim has visited my class. Um, Bill Cobb has come. Um, Haskell Small. Uh, so having some outside visitors who have other expertise has always been a terrific addition for my course. So, okay. Um, so just quickly, uh, when I'm first introducing the game, of course I show them 
what it looks like when you're one move away from capture, so just to get down to the brass tacks. Um, the funny thing is, um, I have to do this as well. It's helpful to show them what it actually looks like <laughs> after the stone's not there anymore. When you're first learning, you kind of picture the stone still there after the capture, and it's good to point out that this is actually what it's gonna look like. You're not gonna see <laughs> any black stones. Um, so after a, a day or so, they um, should have some sense of what I call the abbreviated rules of Go. So these, this is my own uh, abbreviated rules of Go, but I think summarizes the game pretty well, except for some details like Ko and Seki, <laughs> which uh, are, of course are a bit more subtle. Um, also, I want my students to gain a respect for uh, the game and for um, the, their opponents. So um, I do talk a little bit about etiquette. Um, uh, I expect students to be polite, uh, quiet when other people are playing. Um, I have them actually bow to each other when they start a game and then shake hands when it's over and to review games as often as is possible. Um, so this is more of a joke, of course, but uh, I found this from a, a Korean primer on the game of Go. And th this includes all sorts of things, like uh, it's a taboo to take a move back, eating, browsing left and right, reading newspapers or magazines, things like that. So, so it's just kind of for fun that I include this, but, um, but it's to underline that uh, you should be respectful uh, when you play. Um, then the next thing, uh, obviously, I cover uh, talking about uh, the idea of eyes and life and death. Um, you know, there's a couple of, let's see, I guess I, you can see on the top left, uh, on the left side, that some dead groups, uh, an unsettled group on the right, it depends who plays first, and a, a live group on the bottom. Um, and then we start learning some basic proverbs next. Um, so two eyes live, one eye dies, and I give examples of that, some simple ideas. Um, before long, we have to talk about co, of course. So here's the uh, start of a co rule. <laughs> uh, so in this situation, of course, white can capture. Um, and then at this point, black, of course, as you know, can't retake, and, uh, or else the game would get kind of monotonous if it just went back and forth. Uh, so I point out to them that you might have a situation like this. Maybe uh, even though earlier I called this white group at the bottom alive, if black makes a move there, now um, white has a couple of choices. White could either end the co, but then uh, suffer the consequences of dying at the bottom. Or um, also what white could do is the following. White could, of course, answer the co-threat, uh, and then black has the opportunity to play back. So these are all, of course, second nature to all of us, but it takes a while to explain and to appreciate the, the nature of co. Some people have uh, estimated that co itself adds maybe 50% to uh, interest of, and difficulty of the game itself. You know, without co, it'd be a somewhat simpler game. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, there's different types of co. So we talk about, multi, eventually, not on the first day or second day or anything, but multi-stage and multi-step co's and molasses co. By the way, I call a co that's extremely scary where you might lose everything, an Edgar Allan co. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so, so in this situation we have a triple co, uh, which is sort of a classic uh, example uh, Black could play at A, of course, then white could play at B, then black could play at C, and then white could play back at the top and black on the right side, and, and uh, after six moves, we'd be back to the exact same position that we have shown here. And uh, I tell them, of course, about the legendary game, which probably never actually happened, but <laughs> um, uh, a game in the Honoji Castle in 1582 where this situation supposedly came up and uh, Oda Nobunaga, the great uh, warlord, you know, was killed the next day. Uh, so I, I, I've actually been fortunate enough to once teach Go in Japan in Kyoto, and so we could go visit like the Jokoji Temple where the Hanimbo House is, and, and uh, this temple, uh, well, the, what's in, next to what, it doesn't exist anymore, but uh, it, it's been rebuilt next to where it was, so it's kind of fun to actually see the actual places. Um, next, I um, show, we go through all sorts of life and death problems. So this will seem easy to you, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, black has basically two 
alternatives that look reasonable at first glance, but of course uh, playing at the 2-2 two, two point would not be too helpful, but the 1-3 point <laughs> is quite a bit better. But, uh, you know, we go through all sorts of elementary uh, life and death problems. Um, this is a little more interesting, uh, a problem like this. So white to capture. So I won't go through the solution, but this is the sort of thing where the students might argue back and forth a little bit and try to figure out. Um, I talk about stone efficiency, of course. Um, I mentioned that if you place a black stone in the, in the corner, it only has two liberties. On the side it has three, and in the center it has four. So that might argue that's safer to be in the center. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with six stones, you can build a lot more territory in the corner than you can on the side or in the center. And it's this interesting um, balance in Go that's so you know, that, that adds interest to the game. There's no simple answer of where to play. Uh, and some of these are a little darker, but um, so, for example, uh, we spent some time talking about different shapes. So this is basically talking about different rectangular six situations. So, of course, uh, rectangular six is generally, in the center, say, known to be alive. But it's a bit different um, once you're in the corner, and depending if you have no liberty, one liberty, or two liberty, two liberties. So we we'll talk about that a bit. Um, now these, unfortunately, I've, these have been uh, scanned in and are kind of dark, but we go through various Tsuji situations, uh, various life and death problems. These are the sort of things that would be part of their test. So uh, it may be difficult to see, but here, when I, I have a, uh, a way to look at this, I think. So like this, there's a bunch of black stones, right? One, two, three, four, five right there. And as you know, the move is to play right in the corner. Um, so it uh, comes as somewhat of a, as a surprise when students are learning about the game. Um, we also study Varys Joseki, and again, I apologize for how dark these are. But these deal with uh, comparing the San San, the nature of the San San stone that holds the corner from the Hoshi stone, which holds the outside or has more of an outside influence. Um, uh, and also, the one thing that uh, is good for a beginner to realize is it matters who started first. <laughs> if there's a stone at the 3-3 three, three point and then your opponent plays at the 4-4, four, four, you're likely to get a pretty good sized corner. But if your opponent already has a stone at the 4-4 four, four and you play 3-3, three, three, that's a different situation. So the order does matter. You'll be able to live in the corner, but uh, in a more minimal way. Um, then we talk about ladders. So. Uh, we do some basic ladders, of course, but then I set it up to make it a little more difficult with some ladder breakers. Does anybody in the audience want to tell me whether white gets out of this ladder or not? By some of the first row. <laughs> so I, I think that works as a ladder breaker, the, the white stone, actually, in this case. Let you think about that. <laughs> um, then we talk about nakade, or various uh, eye shapes. Uh, all of these are uh, well, some are dead, but most are unsettled. But of course, if uh, white plays first, white can kill black. But it's good to know how many moves it may take to actually move those stones off the board. Um, we also do some semi-AI semi or race to capture. So here, it looks like the white stones have seven liberties and the black stones look like they have seven liberties as well. But this is another good example of showing why a group with one eye has a huge advantage over a group with no eyes. Uh, so essentially, their common liberties really belong to black, not to white. So black is actually way ahead in this race, in this situation. Um, we also talk about determining the value of a move. So I just make up, this is just to give some examples. So here, uh, black has two groups of seven stones that are in some trouble. So uh, black might consider playing either the triangle move at the top or the X move at the bottom. Uh, and in uh, both cases, black can save some stones, but will lose some others. So determining the actual value. Uh, if, if black saves the stones on the bottom, and then white gets to play at the triangle spot, then white will gain 13 points, or 15 points, I guess. Wait, no, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, 15, uh, 14, 15, is that right? So OK, I, ha I haven't looked at this for a while. Uh, on the other hand, if black saves those and white kills this group, then, um, oh, 
White would capture here, let's see, I guess I should think this through. I should have thought this through earlier, but white would gain 15 points, but black would get three. So white would have a net gain of 12 if black plays at the X. On the other hand, if black plays at the triangle uh, spot, black will save all those stones, but white will capture this group and actually gain 14 and 17 points, I guess, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, so it's better for black to play the X. So it's worth five more points if I calculated that correctly. If I didn't, correct me later. But, um, but these are the sort of decisions, obviously, we all have to make when we're playing a game of Go. By the way, after looking at this situation, I might, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, let me just, somewhere I have a, uh, here it is. If we change that white stone to a black stone, then how does the situation change? So that would make quite a difference in the calculation, because <laughs> white would no longer have a live group there. Uh, and th then it becomes uh, more important for black to play the triangle stone rather than the X stone. OK. Um, I also include, like, I'm sorry this is so dark. This is Nakayama Shicho problem that ends up looking like a heart-shaped uh, sequence, which is kind of fun. Um, this one's probably kind of dark also, <laughs> but um, this is a famous problem called the Bright Pearl's Quest to the Sea, or the Brilliant Clam's March to the Sea. Uh, and this involves having three stones diagonally around the white stone, and then uh, two, uh, like five stones, sorry, can't see it too well, but having five stones surrounding uh, the white stone, and whether white can break out or not. Um, so let me move to the next slide, but I'll say a little more about that, actually. So here's a similar problem. This is sometimes called Iwamawa Jutaro's prison break, uh, where the white stones are trying to escape. By the way, a, a very effective way I found to teach this sort of uh, problem, um, rather than just have the students pair up and work together on their own or look at it just by themselves, I have them come to, I pick two students to come to the front of the room, one person takes black, one person takes white, and they play it out, and whoever wins gets to stay there. And then the next, then a third student comes up and takes that. And they keep going, and a student might win two or three or four times in a row, but it eventually gets beat. In other words, you know, if he's black, white breaks out or, or vice versa. And then they stay there as long as they can. And the interesting thing is, even though these are very complicated problems for someone at my level, uh, maybe not for a very strong, you know, high-level Don player or a professional, but uh, the students as a group will figure these out. It, uh, so the collective knowledge of a group of people, uh, it, it's, it really shows how two heads or 16 or 24 heads are better than one. Uh, if they haven't quite worked it out, when I get to the last student, then I go up, and then uh, since I've studied the problem, you know, I, I try to finish it off. But oftentimes, they actually arrive at the solution to some pretty difficult problems. So just to show you for this problem, um, it's kind of a long sequence, but it's a beautiful problem of playing at the center of symmetry, if you haven't seen this problem before. So in other words, the best move for white is to play on top of those two black stones. Without that, white can't break out. So that shows one of many, many possible sequences. Okay. Um, uh, in my uh, course pack, they have, uh, I've written about 30 biographies of famous Go players and some less famous, but uh, famous among Americans at least are people like Janice Kim and Jim Kerwin, Michael Redman, et cetera. So I expect them to learn and uh, to learn about some of these players as well. Um, of course, I'm extremely interested in them learning about the culture of Go. Uh, so, whoops, let's see. So, a couple of quotes just about Go itself. Um, and I want them to appreciate that the game has a long history and is a very deep game. Um, we also read some poetry about Go. In fact, I've taught the course twice with an English and environmental studies professor, John Elder. Um, one semester we called it Go and Haiku. So uh, we studied Basho and Busan and wrote our own haiku, <laughs> not all about Go, but some, uh, but we also read other ones. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly uh, read this. So there's a uh, Du Fu. Um, the sparkling river meanders round the village and the long summer days still the countryside. Swallows flit in and out of the eaves of my house while gulls nestle up to each other in the water. As my dear wife draws a Go board on paper, and my son bends a needle into a fishing hook. I, though plagued by illness, need only my medicine. What else should I seek from my humble self than these things? 
So I find that a very moving poem and a nice tribute to Go. <laughs> we also look at, I have a personal interest in ukiyo-e or uh, woodblock prints, so we look at some of them, especially that have Go as a theme for those. Um, and finally, I want to just go through a bunch of math things. That, since I'm a math professor, I do have some interest of in how math and Go relate to each other. <clears throat> so one thing I ask them to do is to take a Go board and make as many minimal shapes as possible. Uh, so there's a, a, a t-shirt or, or a poster, I guess, made by KGS that has a similar sort of thing to it. So this is not every possibility, but it's most of them. So it turns out with just six stones in a corner, you can make a live two, two, two eye group. On the side, you need eight, and in the center, you need 10. But there's many different non-isomorphic, you know, different configurations of stones that do that. Um, another thing I do with my students, it doesn't directly relate to Go, but you can't really study this in any book or anything, and it gives them some sense of keeping track of liberties. I ask them, make as many groups that have eight liberties as you can on a 19 by 19 Go board. It turns out you can't make all of them because there's more than four corner positions, so you can't fit it no matter what the size of the Go board is, all possible eight, stone, uh, eight liberty groups. And this is a student example that actually has a mistake in it. Um, <laughs> so just to show them. Uh, for, so this group and this group are the same, actually. They're isomorphic, they're rigid motions. So that's not really allowable. <laughs> and there's many other, uh, for example, you could remove uh, any of these stones along the edge here and you still have an eight stone group. So there's many other possibilities. But it's kind of fun, it's a neat exercise, uh, just to get familiar with the idea of liberties and shapes and things of that sort. Uh, even though it might not translate directly into becoming a stronger Go player. Um, so I'm kind of curious what shapes you can make uh, that have minimal number of liberties. So just to show you. So there's only one shape with two liberties in the top corner. There's three different shapes that have three liberties. Those are the three. When you get to four liberties, so... Um, so here's some four liberty groups. Now notice there's two colors. Pretend the white stones aren't there. Each of the groups here have, if the white stones were not there, there'd be four different groups with four liberties. Um, the white stones are my way of showing you on one slide other possibilities. You can add or subtract any of those white stones and still get a four liberty group. So for example, on top here, you could add that stone or take it away and you have a four liberty group. And you could add or subtract either or both of those white stones and have a four liberty group. So there's really two plus four, six, seven, eight different configurations shown on that one diagram. Five liberty groups gets more complicated, and so here's different possibilities. Again, you could add or subtract any of the white stones, say, in the top left corner, and still have a five liberty group. So there's actually eight different possibilities shown just in the top left corner. And it turns out this is not all of possibilities. There's also that, <laughs> so it goes on and on. Uh, and here's, so, this, I believe, though, actually is, so I don't know if anyone's ever studied this, so this is my own study. <laughs> I think this shows all possible internal 10 or few liberty groups. By internal, I mean uh, the group does not touch the side or the corner of the board. So there's far fewer groups of that sort. Uh, so like here's a group with, uh, with six liberties, four liberties, you know, et cetera. And I think 10 or fewer, that includes all possibilities. So it just makes it onto a 19 by 19 board. Um, finally, uh, just a couple of things uh, relating Go to mathematics. I feel personally that Go is almost a subfield of mathematics. Uh, mathematics at its highest level is a creative art and discipline, much as is Go. Uh, both uh, Go and mathematics include uh, counting, geometric uh, intuition, you know, counting prisoners, estimating territory and go, visualizing sequences of stones. Uh, in math, you have to sort of do things in a, a linear to, to prove something. It's very similar. Um, determining number of moves, keeping track of co-threats, et cetera. Both at a higher level involve problem solving. Uh, so like status problems, life and death, you have to check out every case. Uh, in math, you can't just say, oh, it worked in this case, in this case. To prove something has to be true in all cases. And Go has the exact same feeling when you want to prove 
uh, a sequence that kills or, or lives, you have to show that it's absolutely true no matter what your opponent does. Um, so breakout problems, reading out ladders, capturing races, etc. And my last slide, just to let you know, <laughs> uh, is this. So uh, the essence of Go and mathematics, I think, have a lot in common. These are some quotes from some math books, actually. So uh, from the book, Proofs That Really Count, uh, they define mathematics as the science of patterns. Well, that applies to Go just as well as to mathematics, of course. Um, in both, there's a great sense of discovering significant universal truths rather than creating something new. Even though uh, when you discover something, you feel like you're discovering something that already existed, and it's just that you're finally reaching your own understanding of it, and that's very much true in Go as well as mathematics. Uh, in both, there's an unbounded creative opportunities within a well-defined rigid structure. Uh, I find that creativity works best when there's actually a rich, rigid structure to work under, but that still allows for the creative process, and Go is certainly uh, the paramount example of that. Uh, in both cases, rules are simple and elegant, uh, yet the game is you know, incredibly complex. They both have perplexing foundational problems. The rules of Go are still argued today, and there's similar things within mathematics that I won't talk about right now. Um, they both involve careful thinking, long-range planning, they both have long, rich history, uh, and that's worth learning about interesting personalities, and uh, including all of us here, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, uh, in uh, the book, A Mathematician's Apology, G.H. Hardy, a very famous Cambridge mathematician, wrote that mathematicians are ambitious, have intellectual curiosity, professional pride. Uh, their good mathematics is significant, serious, has generality, depth, difficulty, et cetera. I believe all the same attributes apply to the game of Go at its highest levels. Um, and finally, both are appealing, inspiring. Uh, the joy of discovery is very much alive uh, in both cases, and especially the thrill of gaining a greater understanding and a self of, uh, sense of self-improvement. So uh, thank you for your time and patience with me. <laughs> Just made it. Any, any questions or comments or criticisms? <laughs> I guess. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Hi. Thank you. When we're ready. Okay. So, I I, yes, I very much enjoyed your talk, and it, you. I was thinking of, of teaching a course like this myself. Um, I was thinking about the twenty percent you give for improvement. Yes. And I, I remember years ago I took a French course at university and there was a kid in the class who basically was fluent and he was gaming the system sure. by pretending not to know. H have you run into that at all? I, I haven't, but I've thought about that. <laughs> uh, so I make it clear that this course is an introductory course for people who have not played Go before. I've had many international students, including from Thailand, even Japan, uh, China, actually. Uh, but fortunately, none of them knew the game other than knew about the game, or at least pretended not to know too much about the game. Uh, and, but that's why I look for improvement. So if they did start at a higher level, uh, obviously they could contribute a great deal to the course, uh, but I'd expect them to improve and move up as well as, as a complete beginner. So originally, I, I think I counted it like 0%, then 10, and 15, I'm up to 20%. <laughs> so, but I don't think I'll go much higher than that. But good question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, I enjoyed your talk quite a bit also. Um, your thoughts about, I, I make a distinction between exposing people to go and what I've been thinking more recently about is uh, making it more likely that people become go players as mm -hmm. opposed to exposure. Just your thoughts about sure. that issue. Okay. So I, not being a professional go player myself and having limited knowledge, I realize I'm not teaching them uh, the way most of us, when we take a Go lesson from a, a strong player or professional, which is how to gain in technique and ability. So I'm, I'm focused more on exposure to the game. Uh, but uh, I hope to, to uh, share my enthusiasm and love of the game, and I hope that that rubs off a little bit. And so several students usually continue to play. I've also, when I first came to Millbury College, I formed a Vermont Go club. Uh, meets in Burlington, Vermont, which is about an hour north and I go there every Wednesday myself, and I often take some students with me. 
And once the course ends, usually a couple will continue, at least for about a semester. But once uh, all the pressures of college, um, you know, not many continue beyond that uh, until oftentimes years later, I may hear from them where they've picked up the game again and they might even be teaching some of it if they end up being a high school teacher, say. I've had several students continue. So, so I hope to encourage that, but uh, it's more exposure than, than skill. Was another question? Or? By the way, I beg to differ that you are a professional Go teacher, so you are a professional. Oh, in the okay. game now, so. um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did have the opportunity to teach uh, several semesters in college as well, and I remember uh, hearing your name and, and then beyond that knowing absolutely nothing what to do actually to how to structure the course. So um, I tried a lot of different things every semester. I changed the, the technique sure. and, and the grade balancing and everything. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you have tried over the years and what has failed and um, what, you th what kind of ideas you had and wild ideas maybe in and yeah, so thank you. Okay, um, well, uh, fortunately I don't think I've had too many complete failures, <laughs> uh, but uh, there have been times when I've expected too much writing, for example, and rewriting, because this is a college writing course. Uh, as far as uh, Go playing itself, I, I personally, it uh, doesn't work well. Some people, it, it may work for others, but not for me. Many people like to introduce Go on a 19 by 19 board, and they give a nine stone handicap. And they beat the beginner, you know, the new player, a million times in a row. And uh, so I, I try to give positive feedback as soon as I can. So that's why I start on a smaller board where you get quicker turnaround, more feedback in general, and where there's a ch great chance for success. In fact, when I move up to, 17, to uh, 19 by 19, I give a 17 stone handicap. So I place the stones at the, four, the nine Hoshi points the four Sansan points and the four seven seven points. Uh, and, uh, oh, okay. And so, uh, anyway, uh, that seems to work pretty well. Okay, so thanks again. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you.